Welcome to Italics, television for the Italian American experience. I'm your host, Anthony Tamburri. In this episode, Dr. Joseph Shora interviews Masa Mengiste about her recent novel, The Shadow King, shortlisted for the 2020 Booker Prize and named a Best Book of the Year by the New York Times, NPR, L, Time, and more. Mengiste was born in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, and she is a professor in the MFA program in creative writing and literary translation at Queens College. Mengiste's novel is an epic song that highlights the importance of Ethiopian women warriors that confronted Mussolini's invasion in 1935. Welcome, Amasa Mengiste. It's so wonderful to have you here. Thank you. It's really great to be here. I, I've been looking forward to this. Your book, The Shadow King, that we'll be talking about today, has been shortlisted for the Booker Prize. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Today is the day before the presidential um, election, but it's also on the Catholic calendar, All Souls Day and a day in which Catholics in particular remember and honor and commune with the ancestors. And I couldn't help but think that your book, The Shadow King, is, is to some degree in keeping with that sentiment. The book begins with the main character, Hirut, who tells us, the reader, that she does not want to remember. But yet, where you tell us as the author, the many dead insist on resurrection. So could you tell us a little bit about the book for you as a kind of resurrection of ancestors, a retelling of that, those past stories? The book begins in 1974, almost four decades after the confrontation with Italy. And then the book goes back and stays in 1935 or the 30s um, and 40s throughout the rest of, of the story. But I wanted to begin in 1974 it's the eve of a revolution in Ethiopia. Things are very unstable. There are demonstrations, protests happening. But then you have Hirut, who is a soldier um, during the 35 conflict with Italy. I was really curious about memory. And, you know, there are declarations that, that will tell the world that a war ended but I've always been curious about when does war really end for its participants? And is it ever really finished? Um, so this idea of memory and remembering what happened in the past as a way to resurrect and honor the dead and those who fought was, was important to me. But I was also thinking about, are there things that can be kept buried also? Um, or is it inevitable that, that things will always come to the surface the minute we begin to think about the past? You say that you were looking to uncover the gaps in European and African history, in particular around um, issues concerning women and their roles in um, fighting war, but also in their presence in historical accounts. I've always heard the story from the male perspective. I've always heard this history told from the perspective of those men in my family, in my neighborhood, in, you know, in our regions where my family was from, those men who fought. I had been told that women were there, but they were the caretakers, getting the water, you know, cooking food, doing all those things. I had never heard about the fact that women were in the front lines in this war until, uh, frankly, I stumbled on a newspaper article from the New York Times. It was November, actually, 1935. And there's a tiny article about a woman who picked up the rifle of her husband after he was shot and killed in battle and led the rest of his men into that battle and into victory. And it also told me that, number one, these women existed. Number two, this woman, for her to have done this, had to have been standing right next to her husband and fighting beside him all along. She didn't run from the camp to come in. Um, and so that was my first clue that there was a lot more to this story. And the fact that this was a tiny article um, 
you know, on in a newspaper that was blaring the conflict between Italy and Ethiopia, you know, on its front pages for months and almost an entire year before things got heated up with Hitler and, you know, World War II and it moved off the front pages. Um, this was just something relegated to the side as a small oddity, and then it seemed to have been forgotten. Uh, and this felt to me the way that the stories of these women had been handled for decades. The historical context for the Shadow King, in which the fascist regime of Benito Mussolini invades Ethiopia in 1935. The fascist invasion of uh, Ethiopia by uh, the Italian government was something in the United States that was on one hand supported by Italian Americans, some Italian Americans who supported the fascist regime, but was also condemned by Italian American anti-fascists who joined um, forces with African Americans in places like New York City and elsewhere to renounce and protest against this invasion. So it's something that um, resonates with the Italian American history, although it may be somewhat um, erased and, and left to the, to the margins of how we understand Italian-American history. In my research, I started discovering the stories of the way the war over there was playing out here in New York. And I, was, I stumbled upon old police records. And um, you would see in their, in their police reports, whatever the, the thing was, they would put up weekly in, in regional newspapers, encounters between African-Americans and Italian-Americans, and they were, they were punching each other out and fighting over this war. There were incidents, you know, between the anti-fascists and people who supported Mussolini. There were protests and marches happening throughout Harlem. Italian-Americans, um, pro-fascist Italian-Americans were enlisting to go into the war. And then you have African Americans trying to do the same thing in fundraising. It gripped New York, if if not the rest of the world, and wherever the Italian diaspora and you know African Americans were, there were definitely some confrontations. Um, it was a fascinating moment to look at. I've talked to some of the children of Italian American Italians, and they're now Italian American, who fled. Italy in order to avoid being sent to Ethiopia. Um, and I have found that this is a, a moment that hasn't been discussed enough. Th these are stories that I think need to come out more. For sure. And, and what's really wonderful about your book is that you are venturing into this terrain and has this uh, sweeping um, um, account, but with the sort of in-depth of the and intimacies of the various uh, characters that are um, that you write about who are both Ethiopians who are uh, actively fighting against the Italian invasion but also the Italian inv invaders they are characters as well mm -hmm. and one of the things that I, I enjoyed about the book was that we see these characters we see their flaws their fears their loves um, so that even some of the Ethiopian characters, the um, combatants, are not the grand heroes that we, maybe some of us would want, some, some reader might want. They have their own flaws, some of them deep flaws, and that the invaders, the Italian invaders, you know, we get a sense of them as individuals. They're not just these sort of faceless monsters. And so there, there's depth to everybody that... Um, um, that we learn about as we read through the book. And that was, I think, really wonderful. Thank you for saying that. I wanted to tell the story from both sides of the battle lines. When I went to Italy, I lived in Rome uh, for almost a year to do research in the fascist archives, but also to talk to Italians and talk to the descendants of those soldiers who fought. And the thing that kept coming up again and again to me was that these were men who, um, even though they were doing brutal and, and horrible things in Ethiopia, they were loved by their families and they, and they loved, they were capable of those emotions, that they were something else perhaps before they were sent to war. Uh, and I, I wanted to convey both 
both aspects of, of, the, of what war does um, to human beings. With Ettore, my character who is just a soldier and takes his camera to war, I was really trying to figure out um, how does a decent person do indecent things? Like, how does that happen? Uh, and he's also, he was, he's also Jewish um, because I understood the, the history of anti-Semitism in Italy during, during Mussolini's time. And those things were very connected, the, the Ethiopian invasion, the need to colonize, the, the need to, to create a new Roman Empire, which meant that you had to identify who is really Italian and who is an enemy. And unfortunately, Italian Jews fell under that, that you know, definition of enemy by 1938. And I found it really fascinating to, to try to figure out what it might have meant for one soldier to be there in Ethiopia doing something he never thought he would be doing and you know, oppressing groups of people. And then he finds himself uh, victim to the same kinds of laws. Our main character is Hirut, a daughter of Gete and uh -huh. Fazil, uh -huh. born in the blessed year of the harvest. She is someone who is constantly in the state of becoming, um, being transformed in the situation she finds herself before the invasion is happening, as it is happening, and then as the war really takes on. I was wondering if you would read us um, a little section um, from the book. Yes, there's a chorus in the book, and this is the chorus uh, that at this point has divided up into separate voices. Voice one, you will say, I am not a slave. You will say, I am Gete's daughter. You will say, I am the daughter of Fasil. You will say again, because you do not think he heard the first time, please. And you will say it until the word becomes a wall that you build around yourself as you are pulled out of your bed and into the blackest night of your life. Voice two. I know how he will do it. I know how he will say it. I know why Hirut will shut her eyes when she enters that terrifying sinkhole. She will imagine she can forget what she does not see, that all disappears when sunlight punctures the night. Hirut. I know that she will hear her name, but she will not answer. She too will crouch and take shelter in her own arms and curse the powers that gave her to this fate. She will push her back against a wall and still hear that voice tap against her chest. He will tell her to say his name. He, a favored son of Ethiopia. She, no more than a space for him to fill. Could you tell us a little bit about Hirut and how, how she came to be for you and what, I guess, what she means? Yeah, Hirut um, was originally for me just a, a servant that was working in the home of this nobleman Kidane and his wife Aster. She played a minor role. She was helping to gather water, prepare, you know, the medicines for for the war. And as I started continuing to do research in this, she kept stepping forward and saying, here I am. This is not just my role. I, I should be something more. And at some point I had decided the book, the draft of that I had done um, once I was done just wasn't working. And I kept thinking, who, you know, whose story is this? And she, she seemed to come to my mind again and said, here I am. Uh, and so I, I rewrote this book centering her, centering those women that I kept finding in different photographs or in different articles. And the book took shape and it was really her story of this maid, a servant, someone who was not supposed to be anything except useful in her life, who finds that as a soldier, she can change, um, she can change herself and change the world around her. You mentioned photographs, and they play a significant role 
um, in the book. It, th there's actually a photograph at the beginning of the book and a photograph at the end. Um, the book begins with a box of photographs. Throughout the book, there are actually pauses in the telling of the story that are just simply called photo, and you focus on a photograph. It's like a family album, but a, of, of a family you sort of know, but don't know, and you want to know more about. When I lived in Rome, I, I started collecting photographs taken by Italian soldiers, those just men who took their cameras to war. They were not photojournalists. They, were, they just happened to have this. And they were photographing you know, their own experiences. This was, for many of them, a chance to, to travel. This might have been the furthest that they would ever travel in their life. So it was an adventure. And uh, the photographs that they were taking were casual photographs, some just them being them with their friends out, you know, by the water or in the barracks or, um, you know, around a table with, with wine. And then there were some that where they would record some of the brutalities that, that were happening. And because they were their photographs, they bypassed a lot of censorship. These were very different from the kinds of photographs that photojournalists were taking, and they were sent by Mussolini because photography was a weapon in this war to help create a narrative of Africans that would justify the war. Their photographs were censored. These were things that had been pre-approved by the fascist military to be printed, and I was looking, you know, decades later at that printed material. So I left that and started looking for these soldiers' personal images. Um, I was going to flea markets all across Italy. I made friends with some of the vendors. Um, I made other vendors really uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> uh, what I found was that always at these places, there was always a fascist table. Yeah. And usually what I would do is start looking for the bust of Mussolini, you know, and then when I saw Benito, there, there I would go. I made friends with one in particular, and whenever he would get something, he would send me a text and say, I'm holding some things for you. Photographs were personal encounters with Ethiopians. They were, you know, sometimes with some of the villagers in moments just that felt not violent, but just a casual encounter. They went to market. They were photographing what was sold, who was selling them. They would stand in front of a kiosk or somewhere and photograph themselves. And when I would see these, um, I asked the vendor, how are you getting these? And he said, these men kept these photographs until they died. And when they died, their family doesn't want them. They want to get rid of these memories. Even now, it, these families don't want to necessarily remember all of what happened in Ethiopia. When I would talk to descendants, the family members of some of these soldiers who became really good friends of mine, and I would ask them to to ask their mother, ask their grandmother, please ask somebody about uh, what this relative might have remembered or said about this war. Ask them if they have photographs. Often they would come back to me and tell me, Ethiopia is a wall in our family. We never talk about it and I couldn't, I couldn't get anything out of the family. I have created an online archive of these photographs, some of them, and it's called project3541.com. And I have been asking families with any connection to this history to share stories, to share their photographs, and um, Ethiopians, Eritrean, Somali, Italian, British, anyone who is involved in this to share, and that there are generations of Italians still looking for what happened to their family members, or like I've gotten, um, you know, still looking for family members that they th 
that are in Ethiopia that are half Italian, you know, those children born to those men and those men left. And this tells me that this history is not done yet. And uh, I hope that if some of your viewers are interested, they can go check out this website and send send an email if they have information about their own family. Clearly this, this sort of erasure of history or this wall, as you say, um, has to do to a large degree because the Italians after the war didn't contend with um, their complicity in fascist brutalities in not only in Italy, but of course in, in, in Africa and in other, part, in other parts of Albania and Greece and, and other parts of Europe. So this, this history is unresolved in so many different ways. Yeah, it's absolutely unresolved. And if a national reckoning had happened, I really wonder um, about some of the ways that Italy's current politics would have been different uh, because there was that history to acknowledge that would have helped develop the discourse today. Right. I mean, in particular with, as you know, immigrants that are coming, have mm -hmm. been arriving, uh, children who, um, of immigrants who are born in, in Italy, yeah. um, this notion as if it's all, it's all new, like the encounter with Africa and yeah. Africans is all new, when yeah. of course it was going on before fascism. Absolutely. And I, you know, I think there is a new generation of Italians called the second generation that are forcing these conversations to happen. There are writers back uh, back there who are doing this. I think the the conversations I've had with Italian Americans here have been actually, you know, also very enlightening because it's it, it, this is not a history that stayed only in Italy and only in Ethiopia. It it was brought here. Um, I find that absolutely fascinating, and I wish that there were more of these conversations that could happen. Well, we'll we'll keep on we'll keep on keeping on with this. <laughs> right. um, so, did I read correctly that the book is being translated into Italian? It is. It is, and it will be um, released in 2021 by Einaudi. The translation is, I think, almost almost done. So, I'm I'm really excited about it. Great. That's great. Tell us about how the book has been received by Ethiopian American, Ethiopian diaspora, and Ethiopia. I have had such an overwhelmingly positive response. Um, it has been really humbling. People knew small snippets of, of the history because of their family, but no one had, had, no one had a sense of what was happening mm -hmm. on a daily basis during this war or the real ramifications or consequences or brutalities in the war. I was intrigued by the fact that a spoken dialogue does not have quotation marks. Mm -hmm. What was going on there? You know, I thought of this book as a song, as a musical composition, which meant that action and dialogue, it blends together. I imagine that the chorus, there was a chorus telling us about all of this and then periodically stepping out to speak. And it broke up the rhythm and I was also thinking about the ways that action and thought are so tightly knit together that we're often unaware of how what we think can produce actions that are seamless, but we think we're hiding them. And at some point when I finished the book, um, I thought, oh my God, like who, somebody, Somebody's going to complain. I know people are going to complain. Let me see if I can fit some of these punctuation marks. And it didn't work. It just kept stopping things in this unnatural way. Whereas the, I wanted the lyricism of this to keep moving through um, speech and, and action. I loved it. You know, I, I came to really <laughs> enjoy that aspect of it. Music in general is an important aspect of the book. Hali Selassie, we read, is taken with Aida, and he yeah. listens it, to it on, on records uh, over and over again. And as a folklorist, I was pleasantly surprised um, uh, to encounter the traditional performers, the Asmadi, uh -huh. um, and the Masingo. Masingo, yeah. Which is the uh, single stringed lute and the mm -hmm. krar. Yeah, which yeah. is like a, a lira. lira. Yeah, a lira. yeah, yeah. So not only were there these performers there, but these performers 
um, are history tellers, right? They, they, they recount uh, actual events. But what you do so wonderfully, I thought, um, was that the stories that they tell, this sort of mythic historic um, account, um, are slightly off at, at times. Um, you tell us that the, the future singers of these his, historical narratives are in fact, didn't quite get it correct, mm -hmm. um, but it still um, added to the heroic character um, um, of the various uh, individuals that are discussed. And I, I really, really enjoyed that. The Asmari, they still exist today. They perform in tiny bars across Ethiopia. And when you go in, what they do is they they can they you sit down and they start performing and they go from person to person and make up songs about that person. They're hilarious. They can be embarrassing. In '35, they were also talking about the the battle that just happened and singing that and rendering that in such a way that. Ethiopians, the villagers, those people that needed to be remembered were remembered in a way that left them dignified. While I was getting to the end of this book, the film Cristo se affermato a Eboli, when I was watching that then, um, in that small village, you know, in Italy, there were these town criers that would go through. And when I went to Sicily, the times I've gone and I hear the men calling out or the vendors calling out the sales of the of whatever they're selling in that voice i hear the connection to the asmari that we've always done things through song and it's been a way to remember and to hear better uh to listen more uh and i think in that way the the two countries are really connected and i wanted to put that in the book uh, partly as a nod to definitely Ethiopians, but also recognizing that this was part of Italian culture. It was a wonderful, you know, just kind of dialogue all over it that was uh, really enjoyable. Thank you so much. Thank you. You might read from this paragraph that we discussed earlier. Once again, Ettore looks around, willing himself to focus on the messy pile of photographs in front of him. He used to be so much neater. His photographs used to be arranged by date, newspaper clippings kept in strict chronological order. The box he gave to Hirut a lifetime ago was carefully organized and labeled. Since leaving the army, he has come to care less about the sequence of things, has come to understand that it is impossible to connect what happened to what will. What he knows is this, there is no past, there is no what happened. There is only the moment that unfolds into the next, dragging everything with it, constantly renewing. Everything is happening at once. It's a wonderful passage that speaks very much to today and our time at this moment. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for watching this episode of Italics. We wish you all a happy and peaceful 2021. I'm Anthony Tamburri. Arrivederci alla prossima puntata. <laughs> <laughs>